Hello, all my history-loving friends. If this is your first time here, welcome. This is a channel that is a safe space for history-loving peoples everywhere. Today, as you might have guessed, we are going to be talking about a dead hot guy named Mickey Mantle. I will be spending today in Commerce, Oklahoma. You should know that I did make two trips to this town. You may see me in various outfits and various states of tiredness. I spent two full days there. I had a lot of fun and there will be two videos coming out of this trip. Please enjoy yourselves, leave comments, subscribe, do the whole notification thing, cause I'd really like to hang out with you again and I hope you will come back. For now, let's spend about 30 minutes with Mr. Mickey Mantle. Welcome all of my history loving friends. I am inside Mickey Mantle's childhood home here on Quincy Street in Commerce, Oklahoma. So his family moved into this house when he was about three years old. Three or four, I've heard different um, different years on that. But the photograph I've seen of him sitting on the, f the front step with his father, he looks about three years old to me. So Mickey Mantle's parents met in Spavanaugh, Oklahoma, which is relatively close to here. She was 26. His father, Elvin, who everyone called Mutt, was 18. She had been divorced. Her name was Lovell. And she had two children. And so when they met in the late 1920s, not only was it not common for a younger man to, wear, to marry an older woman, it also was not common to marry a divorcee. It wasn't considered proper. Mutt worked for the highway department, but the stock market had recently crashed, and so he feared losing his job at any minute and that eventually did happen. Mutt did not want to work in the mines. Working in the mines was dangerous. If you didn't die in an accident, you probably would die later of some sort of illness from all of the junk you breathed in constantly. While we're looking at all of this, I want you to keep in mind that up to 10 people were living here once all of his brothers and sisters were born. But when they first moved here, when he was three years old, it would have been Mickey and his mom and dad and his grandfather, Charlie. Now, Charlie, was Mutt's father, and he had raised his children on his own because when Mutt was about eight years old, Mutt's mother died of pneumonia. Charlie worked as a butcher, and when they moved here, because in desperation, Mutt had to work in the mines. It was a Great Depression, you just did not have options. And so even though he knew it would probably lead to his death, whether in an accident or from some illness, he did it anyway, because it was the only way to keep his family fed. No one wanted to work in the mines. They made very little money. It was the Great Depression, so you got a paycheck and it came regular. When Mutt went to his interview at the mines, he didn't even ask what it paid. And they didn't ask anything about qualifications. They just said, okay, you're hired. And Mutt was a little surprised by it, but they basically, I think he asked, how will they know I've been hired? And the guy said, do you have two legs? Are you breathing? They literally just wanted fodder. They chewed through their workers. You worked until you couldn't anymore. And then it was, see you later. It was literally every day was, is dad not coming home today? Is this the day? Dad is the one in the white ambulance. And Mutt would come home and he would say, I had a really terrible day today. Two guys got hurt and one was really, really bad. And his dad was dealing with this every single day. The one nicety they always had was a radio because Mutt had to listen to the Cardinals game. He loved the Cardinals. And Mickey would get this love from his father as well. So when they, they did buy a car and his father bought an old LaSalle, that had some issues, but they could afford it. It was the only way he could work in the mines and travel around to his own baseball games. Now his dad, his dad played baseball too, and he was a good player. He decided before Mickey was even born that when Lovell was pregnant, he said, this child, it's gonna be a boy. And if anybody said, well, what if it's not a boy? And he said, well, it's gonna be. I'm gonna name him Mickey, like Mickey Cochran, and he is going to play professional baseball. 
And he started when Mickey was in the cradle. He would throw a ball at him, trying to get Mickey to look at it so he wouldn't be afraid of the ball and that he would learn that it's something good. And when Lovell saw him doing this, she was so angry. She said, stop throwing balls at my baby. So he compromised and started using a ball of her yarn. That appeased her for a while, but when she wasn't looking, he and Charlie would get together and switch back to real baseballs. <laughs> they started trying to get him to hit it with a bat when he was about two. He <laughs> <laughs> firmly believed that the way to get ahead in baseball to get attention was to be a switch hitter. And so from the very beginning of starting to teach Mickey about baseball, he would throw left-handed and his father, Charlie, sorry, the light in here's not great. His father, Charlie, would throw right-handed so that he would learn to swing from both ways. This is not something Mickey was immediately good at. And as a matter of fact, he hated batting left. He was never as good at it. So he would bat right if his dad wasn't there or if he thought his dad wasn't there, he would bat right because it was what he was more comfortable with. Occasionally though, his father would show up unannounced and be so angry with him that he wasn't batting left. When Mutt would get home from the mines, around when Mickey turned five, he started teaching him how to hit. And they used this barn as their backstop. When they moved here, Mutt was attracted to the house because he immediately saw this as, could be used as a backstop. There is damage to this wall, dents from the baseballs hitting it. And they're kind of easier to see with just the coloration because it, there's, that's a really noticeable one. Because of the way the, the dent changed the way the iron corroded. When the owners of this house bought it, Mickey was still alive and they were going to fix this up. And Mickey said, don't. It leaned like this when I was a kid. So they have reinforced it supposedly so that it leans but is not dangerous. However, if you come here, I wouldn't spend too much time inside. I'm assuming that they would have put the LaSalle in here, the car that his dad bought. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was a, <laughs> oh my God. that was a wasp. <laughs> Went right for my face. Sorry, it scared me a little bit. I'm not really scared of bugs, but that, uh, I didn't see that coming. I know they are trying to sell this house and it needs some TLC guys. It needs a new roof. I actually, if you look up there, that is absolutely bowing in. I don't know how long this house is going to be safe. So please, if you have money, and you love baseball, please save Mickey Mantle's house. So I know from photographs when Mickey was living here that this area right here had this height in the front. And since he lived here, they have shorted up so that it's flat. He's sitting right here with his dad and the porch looks like it's being held up with stacked rocks. So one thing I remember involving a bathtub is that he got home and his mom said, you need to go take a bath. And Mickey knew instantly what that meant. It meant that his father was going to take him to see the Cardinals game. And he said that bath took him about two minutes. Just get in, splash off, run outside, ready to get in the car. I want to go, Dad. I'm ready to go now.
Now the house they lived in after this one did not have indoor plumbing at all. And um, the reason they moved is a very sad one. one. Mutt wanted to get out of the mines. It was killing him, he knew it was killing him. But more importantly, it was killing his father. It, um, Charlie killed over one day toward the end of World War II uh, after a practice with Mickey. And Mutt hoped that maybe if they moved away from the mines that the air would be better and it would help his father. But what he didn't know was that his father, Charlie, had lymphoma and he was not going to get better. No matter where they lived, that kind of cancer just spreads through the body using the bloodstream. And there was just nothing they could do. And it was so hard for Mickey to watch his grandfather, his beloved grandfather, die like that. Mickey lived with a very serious fear of death. He not only watched his grandfather die of lymphoma, but his uncle Tunney died of lymphoma in 1947. His father would die of it in 1951. And he didn't know this, but two of his own sons would also die of lymphoma. So after Charlie got sick, they moved briefly to a farm. Where his father worked as a sharecropper that they said in comparison to this house, it, this house was a, a mansion in comparison. It was just a terrible, terrible home. And sadly, it looks like this one needs a roof, badly. Mickey didn't have a whole lot of opportunities to be a regular child. He did have three best friends that he hung around with here in Commerce. Bill Mosley was also an incredible athlete, just like Mickey. Mickey did play football. His friend Bill was the quarterback. He was the running back. I'm going to drive over right now and go show you where that field was. There's one thing for sure. People of Commerce are extremely proud of Mickey Mantle. As you can see, the water tower has his number, number seven, on it. I'm standing right now on what was Commerce High School's football field. Now, there were some people who thought Mickey was actually better at football than he was at baseball. He was extremely fast. And his coach wanted him to try to get a scholarship to college on football. Mickey's dad really resisted letting him play. And the reason for it was he was so afraid of Mickey getting injured in a way that would destroy any hopes of having a career. But Mickey really wanted to play and the coach actually came and talked to him, talked to Mud about it and said, you really, really need to let him play. It'll be good for his reputation. It'll get him more attention. People love football players. And so Mutt finally relented and said, okay, you can play, but just for fun. So right here on this field during a practice, Mickey got hurt and he got hurt very badly. Somehow during the play, he got kicked in the shin and he fell to the ground or he couldn't put weight on it when he got back up. It started turning colors immediately. It was bad enough that he spent the night at his friend's house so that he didn't have to travel all the way home and it wasn't getting any better. By the next day or two, it looked so much worse. It was red and angry and black and blue and swelling and he developed a fever. His fever actually got up to 103. And finally, the coach said, we have to tell Mutt. We interrupt this broadcast for a very special announcement. The house you are looking at right now, it was on the corner just a minute ago and I was walking right towards it. A person walking by told me that Mickey Mantle built this house in 1958. I knocked on the owner's door. He let me inside. My next video will contain footage no one has ever seen before. Seriously, you want to come back for the next episode. Hit subscribe. Hit notification so you know the second I upload this video. Look, that's the deed with Mickey Mantle's signature on it that the guy showed me. I held the key to Mickey Mantle's house in my hand. You don't want to miss this. I don't know if Mickey had a condition before this because apparently all through his life, 
he had had he had boils on his legs and arms and you know they would come and go and he was also abnormally small for his age which is another thing that made Mutt nervous about letting him play because football is a very violent sport with big guys so I don't know if there was an underlying condition that contributed to this they took him to the hospital in pitcher he was there for a couple of weeks 10 days and they knew it was an infection the doctor thought it was an infection the tissue around that area it would turn out later that it was actually osteomyelitis which is an infection inside the bone itself and is a lot harder to treat he came close to losing this leg and they started treating him with penicillin which was a drug miracle drug developed during World War II and used to treat a lot of soldiers so that by the time Mickey got hurt it was easier to get a hold of than maybe a few years earlier because they were pumping him with huge amounts of penicillin he was getting three shots a day they were waking him up at night to give him and he he just wasn't improving and eventually he had to go for treatment in Oklahoma City to a special hospital for crippled children that helped him as a indigent patient and they were able to to get him over it now he would have flare-ups of osteomyelitis the rest of his life but he got to where he recognized when it was coming and he would start treating it early and he did play the next uh, football season he did play and he was one of their best players and I think he probably could have gone into football if he had wanted to, but he really wanted to do baseball because that's what his dad wanted. I am in Baxter Springs, Kansas at Kiwanis Park. And the reason we're here is because in 1945, a young man named Mickey Mantle was playing for the Baxter Springs Whiz Kids. It was a semi-professional baseball team. The field where they played was right here. This is the Spring River. At one time, this river was the, this was the boundary of the outfield. I wish I knew where home plate was. All I know is it was this direction because this was the outfield. And Mickey Mantle hit two home runs the day Tom Greenway was here to see him. And Mickey had been on his radar. Now, I think some people say Greenway was here to see someone else, but um, I have read that's not true. That he was here to see Mickey and Mickey just happened to hit two home runs, one right-handed, one left-handed. The first one he hit, hit the ground once and then rolled into the water. The second one, which he hit left-handed, landed out in the middle of the river. Green Wade basically tried to get Mickey for nothing. And the book I read, uh, it was called Mutt's Dream, Making the Mick, talked about how he felt a little bad for taking advantage of these backwood hicks, you know, in his estimation, that's what they were. <clears throat> So he signed Mickey for, I'm trying to remember what he got, it was something like $130, but his bonus, and this is what his father, uh, his father basically said he had to have a signing bonus. And so Greenway, I was like, oh, at first Mutt asked for $4,000 and he was just, Greenway said that is just way too much. And finally they negotiated it to 11, 250 or something. And uh, Greenway is thinking, oh man, we've signed people for a $10,000 bonus. Just sad. I mean, ridiculous, but you've got people this poor. Uh, we can just completely rip them off because any amount of money seems like a, a lot to them. Obviously, he would get better deals as time went on, and of course, they wanted to keep him, and he he, he was good. Um, he wasn't a runaway instant success. Mickey had to work for it. He had confidence issues to overcome. His dad had to talk him down at one point when he wanted to quit because he was having trouble, and um, Mutt was pretty much like, well, fine, you want to give up? 
then pack your stuff, let's go. You can come work in the mines with me, you can get yourself killed, you can die early from all the poisons we breathe, or you can work your butt off and make this work. And thankfully, Mickey listened to his dad. I think the home runs he hit here were 400 or 500 feet, and he would go on in the majors to hit some that were more than 700. Now some, they've had to measure that because it hit part of the facade or something stopped it, and so they had to use science to figure out how far it actually went, you know, but um, just so amazing. And I don't know at what point on this river it went in, this is where I pulled over because it's it's where they put boats in, so uh, it kind of shows you where the river is. But I mean, it could have been. Who knows? I don't know. But Mickey Mantle was discovered right here by the New York Yankees, and Green Wade showed up to his high school graduation to sign him because he had to wait for him to graduate. Thanks for coming along on my journey with me. I had so much fun learning about Mickey Mantle today. It's a shame he, um, you know, was a little unhappy later in his life. I don't know if you would say he was unhappy, but you know, he struggled. He struggled with getting over some, some of the trauma he endured as a, a kid of being molested as a really young boy by his teenage stepsister. Um, losing his dad, who he just adored. I don't really know that Mickey cared what anybody thought about him, except his dad. Certainly no one could talk him off a ledge like his dad. That's really sad, because it really feels like once his father died, that that's really what did him in. And it was a fear of death. After watching so many people he loved, so many of the men in his life, his dad, his grandfather, his uncle, all of the male role models he had were dead before 40. I think his grandpa was 62, but he still, he went from robust and healthy and hitting every single day and pitching to Mickey and playing with him to collapsing in the yard one day and then just watching him waste away. I, I honestly think he lived his life the way he did because he th thought he would die before he was 40. Uncle was 34, his dad was 39 or 40, grandpa was 62, and he just thought, there's no way I'm gonna survive. No one in my family does. And as a matter of fact, two of his sons died of the same illness as all of those people I just listed did, Hodgkin's lymphoma. But I do know Mickey was surprised to live as old as he did. He uh, is quoted as saying, and I've read this multiple places, that if he had known he was going to live to be as old as he did, he would have taken better care of himself. And I, I think he just tried to cram in as much joy as possible before he died. It is a shame that his later life was so much about alcoholism. And you know, people adored him and he never understood it. Um, Merlin said he would meet grown men who would weep at meeting Mickey Mantle and he didn't understand that. He didn't want it to be that way and sometimes he was super mean to people. If he was drunk, he was mean. And evidently a lot of the time he was drunk. It's just so sad. It's so sad because I don't think he was like that when he was here growing up. Well, I will see you next time. It has been a wonderful day. I have really enjoyed everything that I have learned about Mickey Mantle and his life here and Mutt. A legend of baseball who lived this close, who grew up this close and had such a amazing childhood story.